solid full of color We'll leave the truth uncovered Cause only lies are white We use the words we write To shine a light on life My light is lava like It's hot and burning bright Now read, recall, recall, recite We covered every angle Hi everybody, we are back with another episode of And Seen I am Cynthia Dorsey I'm Veronique Lachelle McRae And we're so happy you're here with us in the room today um today we are talking about playwright dominique more so dominique is an author of the detroit project which is a three-play cycle that cycle includes skeleton crew paradise blue and detroit 67 Additional plays she has done, Pipeline, Sunset Baby, Blood at the Root at the National Black Theater, and Follow Me to Nellie's. She's also the Tony-nominated book writer on the new Broadway musical, Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations. She's an alumni of the Public Theater Emerging Writers Group. Women's Project Lab, and LARC Playwrights Workshop, and has developed work at Sundance Lab, Williamstown Theater Festival, and the Eugene O'Neill Playwrights Conference. She most recently served as co-producer on the Showtime series, Shameless. Additional awards for Dominique include Spirit of Detroit Award, Pony Fellowship, Sky Cooper Prize, Tear Trailblazer Award, Steinberg Playwright Award, and the NBFT August Wilson Playwriting Award. Um, she's also won an Obie Award. Variety named her a Woman of Impact in 2017. And she was also a MacArthur Genius Grant Fellow. Uh, Dominique Morso recently became the executive artistic producer at the Detroit Public Theater. So we know and anticipate, Vanny just said, she's about to do some major things in her um, hometown. I'm so mm-hmm. excited to be talking about her today because I came across Dominique's name in an L.A. Times article that was written by Ashley Lee on October 14th, 2020. There was a list of 40 Black playwrights in the theater industry who spoke out about the insidious racism in the theater industry. And these playwrights um, lended their names and spoke out about their experiences. I want to uplift, I think the both of us, we've definitely decided that coming into this show, we would be uplifting our women of color who are playwrights and actresses. But I think it's very important to uplift um, our Black women specifically as we talk about women of color who are in the entertainment industry. And I'm going to begin with her. We've already talked about a few of the playwrights whose names are on here. Katori Hall, we covered her work. So we're just going down this list. Um, um, Mind you, if you read this article, you will find that there are also Black men who have put their name on this list as a part of, you know, their arts activism and speaking out. Um, But because our show is centered around women, we will only review the plays of the women on this list. And when we've exhausted the list, we'll move on to others. But I thought we we needed to speak to the times. We always talk about that on here. And Mm -hmm. now is the time to shed light to their work and make sure their work is seen. And a portion of it is read by actors here 
on and sing. I'm really happy to talk about Dominique Morcel with you guys. And Veronique's going to tell you all about the play we're covering today. So Pipeline by Dominique Morisot, it references to the school to prison pipelines. When we look at this piece, it's centered around a single mother who is an educator named Naya who wants the best for her son, Amari. And when we look at the story, we're seeing how the systematic oppression of particularly um, children of color, and we're zoning in on Amari's story as a Black male in the school system. Um, and we see the story set up where she teaches and like in her hometown, um, what would be considered a rougher or a low more income school, but she and her ex-husband have sent Amari to the, a private school, wanting to afford him the best of opportunities. And as the play unfolds, we see how that school to prison pipeline, whether it's private or public school, exists throughout the country. Now, Pipeline was first commissioned by Chicago Steppenwolf Theater Company, and it received its world premiere, like Cynthia said, at the Lincoln Center Theater in New York on July 10th, 2017. Um, that initial production in Lincoln Center Theater was directed by Liliana Blaine Cruz. Um, Dominique's mother actually was a master educator and public school teacher for 40 years. And while she states that the story isn't um, a direct correlation or a story of her mother's that is just in honor of the work that her mother has done as an educator. Um, and her mother was an educator in Highland Park, Michigan. Uh, just the, we, we see the set of characters and what, you know, is probably coined as a pretty short play. It's not, you know, an extensively long play, but we see the care, we have the characters of Naya, her son Amari, the ex-husband Xavier, um, we also get to see um, there is a teacher, um, Lori, I believe, a white female teacher who's been in the system for a long time. We see Dunn, who is school, um, school security. And then also, I believe, is Jasmine, um, Amari's uh, Latina background girlfriend who's at the private school. And throughout these myriad of characters, she creates such a powerful story in such a short amount of pages. Um, I know that Cynthia has been directly in the education system for several years, and I kind of in and out more as a teaching artist per se, but as soon as I read the piece, just I was drawn in because I could see everything she's talking about and everything that I know I as an educator, as Cynthia and many others have experienced and seen in our children of color. Um, so I'm not sure even where to start. There's so many nuggets here. Um, I guess we could just bounce back and forth. What were just one of the things that stood out to you, knowing that even now in pandemic, you're teaching, you know, um, uh, what are some of the things that stood out to you, Cynthia? Listen, I, I just, so first of all, I absolutely adore this play. I think, um, just the constant battle of the dream of the mother for her child with the education system is what stands out to me. Um, it happens all the time. Um, and, you know, I think Dominique speaking to this, you know, using her art as activism because the pri prison to, the school to prison pipeline is real. Um, it's set up for our kids um to be you know it's set up for our kids to prepare them for prison um school is and um I'm, I'm just so happy that someone is speaking it out about it through art um but don't get me wrong it's happening to our boys and our girls it's just manifested differently um but I would say just seeing how the, the parents, the Black parents and the education system go toe to toe every single time, just going against what your plan is for your child, no matter how hard you try to set them up for success. Um, and that, that's a theme that ran with me 
as I read. What about you? Um, I think it really pulled at me because I've had experience in what would be considered like at-risk schools or urban schools. Um, but I have also taught in private schools. And to see the juxtaposition between the two, but the way she reveals that our children experience the same issues. Um, and it just took me back to those private school days, reading about Amari and the microaggressions between the teacher and the way more so referenced in, in Tied and Native Son by Richard Wright into there. And I remember reading that as like one of maybe three black people in class, right? In a, in a what is it, a AG back then, I guess it was called academic league or something back then. And knowing that uh, that uncomfortable feeling, right? And, and what led to what the story reveals without me like giving the whole play away per se. Um, I felt like she really just put the truth on the table because sometimes as parents, like you said, that fight in the education system and wanting to do better, but that environment isn't really necessarily better. I've seen it with my own eyes with the few children of color who were at that private school. And I was the only black teacher and second black teacher in 38 years of that private school. So all the, the microaggressions and the racism, the discrimination that I experienced in my short tenure there, those children have experienced across the years and, I, I, and I've seen it firsthand. So it just really drew me in like, you know, you're trying to do the best for your child in a system that's set up against your child. So, it's, you, you know, it's like sometimes you're at this impasse. What can I do? Because I'm trying to work within a system that is not designed for my child to succeed. And I don't want my child to endure these things. So I try to set up a path that leads my child into these things anyway. Um, also, I just loved kind of the not necessarily timelessness, but I guess timelessness, the sur surrealism of it to where the sets, you know, blended, you weren't necessarily in one certain location and the overlapping um, that she has with the characters and the way she intertwined the poem by Gwendolyn Brooks. So even the writing style, I really love, like, I just thought that that was beautiful because you could see the mother struggle and the sun struggle, but they weren't present in the same space, but still connected. Um, I loved that. Um, I really thought that was beautiful. And even, you know, I loved how they had the white teacher address how this isn't like a, <laughs> and I can't remember the name of the movie right now, but you know, Dominique put it right in there. Like, um, remember that movie from, from what Michelle Pfeiffer was in it? I can't remember the name. It's actually in the play. It's slipping my mind right now, but like this idealistic thing where it still goes back to the white savior complex. Like I'm a white teacher who's going to go in this urban environment and I'm going to save these kids because that's what's idolized in some of these movies. Right. And I remember that movie, you know, like she was being tough and going in and, you know, I'm like, it's, I love the way that she really put it all on the table. And, and even in that teacher's speech, Dangerous. I love that. I think you're muted. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Dangerous Minds. Yes. Yeah. I was like, oh, wait, I think she's muted. <laughs> yeah. Dangerous Minds. Yeah. And I, I love that she addressed that too. Like, this isn't some coming on, you know, because the white savior complex unfortunately runs throughout the narrative of the country, right? So, of course, it's in the school system. And um, you're like, yeah, I'm going to come. And she's like, it's not like that. And even you know, she addressed, you know, that people will make these assumptions, you know, kids are fighting, but if you can't get to the root, you know, and if basic needs aren't met, how can I teach? You know, that's what I used to say when I was in a school and I used to be like, gosh, this feels like prison. And when I did like a long-term theater assignment, you know, lock, I had to have a set of keys and lock the doors and the police officers would come down and round them up and babies would be in handcuffs if they didn't get to class in time. And I understand that like, yeah, they might've been, you know, smoking weed or doing stuff, but I'm also like these neighborhoods, these kids are coming from, 
I'd have kids in class who didn't eat for three days. They don't care about arithmetic. Their stomach is growling, you know? So I love the way she addressed that too. Like basic needs aren't met, but you want me to do this. And you're not going to be able to stop them from fighting until you get to the root of the problem. Um, I just think she beautifully presented several issues across the board without it becoming muddled because some people address a lot of things and it becomes muddled. She was not muddled. It was clear. You can see what she was saying, where it was going. Um, and she addressed a lot in, in this pretty compact play. You know, it's not, it's not like it's a three act 150 page play, but she makes the point. And I loved that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and right, you're so right. It was nice to see her uplift, which is something we um, have to do as a community, uplift those Black writers in her body of work. Gwendolyn Brooks and um, Richard Wright, like uplifting their names as well and their work because we are all impacted by each other's work. And I think her doing that was um, definitely a, a, a homage of sorts um, all within the piece. You're right, it's so many things, so many things to think about. If you are an actor, read it. If you're a director, read it. It's, it's definitely something I would strongly consider directing. Um, yeah, I, I, I really think you guys should read this work. And I'm so um, interested in reading more of Dominique's work and seeing it performed. Um, we have an actress coming on today who um, I would say <clears throat> is a trailblazer as well as Dominique. And um, so I, I'm really excited that we are highlighting the both of them on the show today because they're so similar. It's like, it's crazy. Um, but we're super excited to introduce her to you and I hope you enjoy it. Everybody, we are here with Maisha Tierra. Hi, Maisha. Hi. <laughs> We're so happy to have you. Maisha is an actress and founder and artistic director of Perceptions Theater. She's also a content creator, and we are so happy to have all of this Black Girl Magic in the room with us today. I'm so happy that you're here. Maisha, I was reading about you and your bio, and your story is so intriguing. You um, are from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, originally, and then ended up in Chicago, um, two great cities. Can you tell us <laughs> a little bit about your journey um, as a creative? Yes, yeah, so um, for me, it honestly started when I was uh, five, um, when I started into this whole world of acting. Um, it was an after school program and my parents worked late, so I had to stay at the school regardless. And they told me, you know, me being in Louisiana, it's hot a lot. So they gave me an option. They said, you want to go outside and play basketball in the heat or you want to read a play? And I didn't know what a play was. And I said, well, I don't want to go outside in the heat. So I went to go read a play. And that started my whole journey into what I'm doing today. So after that, that led me to, you know, creative arts, middle schools and high schools. And finally, I ended up at um, Northwestern State University and I majored in theater there. And I got my degree in performance and directing. And I was all when, when I first got there, I was definitely very much um, I would say extremely, I'm not going to lie, I was extremely uh, white centered when it came to the theater world because I, you know, I went to mostly PWI schools my entire life, especially when it came to the arts. And so when I got there, I was just like uh, very, very snooty 
in a sense of how I, you know, I was like, oh, well, theater is the only thing I'm going to do. You know, I could never do film. I could never do TV. Never in my life. Of course, I was 18 and I didn't have any sense. So <laughs> I just thought I was just like, oh, I, I know the world. I've been here. And um, my sophomore year of college, actually, one of our alumni came and they gave us a workshop on uh, film acting and they owned a casting company and they told us, hey, y'all, if you um, want to be in a movie, you know, send us your headshot and your resume and, you know, we'll put you in something maybe. And, I, you know, I didn't really think much about it, but I sent them my stuff. Next thing I know, they're calling me to audition for this film called um, 12 Years a Slave, which I never heard of because apparently it was a book first, but I'd never heard of the book. Um, the day that they wanted me to audition, I actually had voice lessons. So I told them, no, I said, oh, I have voice lessons. I'm not coming. And I, you know, I hung up. I, I look, let me tell you something. I was snooty. I was just like, what? I don't, I don't have time for this. I have other things to do. And so then my friends were like, well, who are you on the phone with? And I let them know it was all some casting people for some movie or whatever. And they made me call them back. And long story short, I got cast in that film. And I was able to work on that film for two months. Um, my first day there, I thinking that I was supposed to really be acting and not just being like an extra in the background. So here I am giving like award winning performance. And so then the next day they pulled me to the side, one of the PAs and they're like, hey, we really liked what you did yesterday. So we're gonna bump up your pay and we're also gonna make you featured. So you're in more scenes with the people that, you know, the people that get the most screen time. So I went from like somebody in the background to somebody where it's like, no, you're in like most of the second half of the film and we can see you. We don't have to pause the camera because they're talking to you. So it was a great experience. I got to hang out with some amazing people. Lupita, when she was still in Yale School of Drama, she, oh, she's such a sweet person. Uh, Chu would tell the director, they were all amazing and they were so encouraging. And to be on a set like that where we're talking about slaves, um, he was able to make sure that the atmosphere was just loving and just full of like black love, regardless of what we're dealing with. So after that experience, like I said, I went on to graduate and I ended up going on tour. So I auditioned at this uh, big audition called UPTA, which is the Unified Professional Theater Auditions. And I pretty much walked out there in front of like a hundred or so theater companies and did monologues and was like, somebody please hire me. I just graduated and I have student loans. Somebody please hire me to say something on a stage. <laughs> and I ended up getting hired. Um, my first job was at this theater company that was in uh, Napanee, Indiana, which is where the Amish live. And I ended up living with the Amish for about two years. <laughs> While I was working at uh, is, uh, Amish Acres Round Barn Theater, so I did a few shows there, and it was a very calming experience because you have nothing but nature. So all I was doing was doing theater and then going and feeding livestock <laughs> after the shows were over. <laughs> so it was it was it was great. And then um, after I got hired by them, I got hired to go on tour for another theater company called, called Bright Star Touring Theater. So I. Um, did shows for them. One of the shows that I really loved the most was where I played uh, Harriet Tubman. So we would go around to different schools and different places and just teach these kids about black history uh, along with other subjects. And after that, I told myself, well, I need to settle down in one spot because I was just traveling wherever who was hiring me. So I was going all over the world. One day I'm in Atlanta, one day I'm over here in New York, you know, wherever. And I told myself, well, let me pick a place that isn't as expensive as LA or New York. And so that's when Chicago came into play because it's like the theater capital of the world pretty much. And then they also have TV and film here. So I went ahead and was like, well, I'll do this and go over here. And I've been here for three and a half years now, almost four years. I came here in 2017, um, right away started auditioning and it led to some amazing opportunities. My first year, I just focused on acting. Um, my second year, I focused on acting and directing. And then my third year, which was this past year, I decided to open a theater company and then COVID hit. So now here we are. <laughs> so like long story short, and here I am today with you all. <laughs> So I just loved um, when I received your bio, just learning more. And oh my gosh, I just have to, I really love your energy. Like every time that we get the chance to interview and just like people's spirits just pop out and you're so bright and I love it. So it has like 30,000 questions in my head. So I'm going to go with the one for now. Can you tell us 
some about that bridge in your journey um, to performer slash director? And how has that shaped your acting um, now that you do more directing and vice versa? How does that combination work together for you? Okay, so um, I'll go with the, the first part of the question you, you asked me. So what made that bridge come together was undergrad. Because when I started, I only wanted to be an actor. I was not interested in directing anything. But once I realized what kind of institution I was in and where a lot of times I've noticed that the, the Black actors and the other actors of color just weren't getting enough attention. And when we were, it was normally related to a race related musical. So we, you know, we're doing hairspray, we're doing the whiz, you know, but when it came time for me to audition for the straight plays, yeah, I would get callbacks, but I wouldn't get cast because, well, these need to be families. And since you're the only black person who's uh, auditioned for the play, and, you know, most of the other black kids were auditioning for the musicals, they were musical theater uh, performers, I would just get kind of left out by the wayside. And I started to realize and open my eyes to the other kids who just were kind of getting left behind, even though we're supposed to be paying for this education. And I said to myself, well, if y'all not going to do it, then I'll do it myself. I'll teach everybody. So this is what I thought, you know, of course, because like I said, I was like, you know, I was young and I was ready. I was 18, 19 years old. And I was like, oh, so you're not going to do it. It's fine. I'll do it myself. So that's when I actually started deciding to take directing classes so I could learn how to actually direct people. And that's what actually bridged that gap for me is uh, seeing that there was a need and that I wasn't seeing people who looked like me on stage being able to do what they love. And I said, well, if you're not going to make them be on stage, well, I am. So my directing department actually would have us do scenes and um, I would hire the black kids and the kids that didn't get hired. <laughs> and I would let them, you know, be in my shows. I rehearsed them. And then we put up the scenes every class period. And that led into me doing a second season show, which is where the students direct their own show. They have control over an entire production. And um, they gave us this sheet of paper that was just like, hey, this is just the application to fill out if you want to direct a show. All you have to turn in is that sheet of paper. But to me, I could hear underlyingly is just, oh, yeah, all you have to turn in is that sheet of paper. But if you don't have anything else to offer us, then you're not getting picked to do a second season. So me being who I am, I said, well, I'm going to turn in the sheet of paper, but I'm also going to block out the first 10 pages. And I'm also going to make an entire trailer for this, uh, <laughs> this play. So that's what I did. I got a lot of the actors together who just weren't getting cast. And I was like, well, I'm going to do for Color Girls. And... <laughs> I hired them to make a trailer one day um, after school, put all the stuff together, gave my um, professors an entire binder with the sheet of paper on top and said, this is my proposal for second season. And they gave me my show and I ended up uh, winning director of the year because we started our own little Tony Awards in my college. So I won director of the year for the play that I directed that year. And that, that started uh, my journey. And what made me transition to trying to balance them both was that once I got here, I was so focused on being an actor and it worked out for me in a, in a sense of the fact that like I was able to be in a span of a year and a half, I was involved in three different equity productions, which, you know, that doesn't happen all the time. So I give all the glory to God because I was just being my very go-getter self and I was just crashing people's auditions. I was like, nope, you didn't invite me. However, I saw how much you pay. So how are you doing Goodman and Steppenwolf and court theater? I'm going to come over here and I'm going to audition. And it paid off for me where I was able to be a part of three different amazing productions. The first one was, um, at Theater at the Center, uh, and I did Still Magnolias. The second show I was a part of was at the Gift Theater, where I um, understudied for the play Hamlet. And the uh, third one was at Court Theater, where I understood it for Colored Girls. So, you know, it's if for Colored Girls, I feel will be a part of my life forever. At some point, I'm sure I end up directing it again. Um, so once I did that my first year, I said, okay, well, we've got this solid footing on acting. I want to direct. And so that what made me go ahead and just started straight up Googling and, and asking the people that I knew, hey, y'all have anybody looking for a director for a one act or something? And I started to like slowly do little small projects. So I do like, oh, I do a reading here while I direct that. Or I do a one act while I was trying to balance my acting career. And so now my third year, I decided to open up a whole theater company. I'm realizing how much extra work it really is. Because, you know, of course, when you 
you're like, oh, I'm gonna just go do this. And then you realize how many checks and balances you have to go through to actually make this project a reality. And owning a theater company, as I'm sure y'all know, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's, it's just a very much a lot. And so I don't get as much sleep as I would like. I'm working on that. So that's, that's a big part of how I've been able to balance it between my acting and my directing is a lack of sleep, which I do not recommend. However, <laughs> I've been able to now, because COVID has really slowed down a lot of everybody's lives, I've been able to focus a little bit more on myself and um, directing. So that's what actually helped me slowing down and just focusing on one aspect because most of the shows that I was in as an actor, they'd all got canceled. So I said, well, I got to do something. And if I'm going to do this company, then I've got to make it work. So that's where a lot of my focus, because of COVID, a lot of my focus has gone to directing. So inherently as creatives, we become activists a lot of time because art mirrors life. Um, where where do you stand with that ideology and who is Maisha as an arts activist? First, I would say I agree that um, there has to be a balance of being able to be an activist while you're doing your art. I feel especially as Black artists because you can just make stuff that's just good, but you also have to be able to make stuff that resonates with people and helps people understand what your experience is because no one can tell you what your experience is you can go to you know a white owned theater and they can hire out people to try to help tell your experience but you're the only one who really fully understands what you're going through and what you have to do so I feel like as an artist we're all in a sense always being an activist because whatever work you're doing it speaks for itself and it speaks for what you do. And a lot of shows I've noticed for myself because I do a lot more dramas than anything is that most of my shows are activist shows without even realizing that they are. So I really have no choice but to be an activist because most of the shows that I encounter are sending a message. Um, and what was the second part of the question? I know you said, what was it? Who is Maisha as an arts activist? That's a good question. Who is Maisha as an arts activist? Maisha is someone who speaks for that little dark skinned black girl with the 4C hair. I always do my best to let her shine. So when I'm being an activist in the arts, because I see the lack, even still today, the lack of diversity when it comes into casting, I do my best to make sure when I'm on the other side of that table, that Maisha, even though, you know, it shouldn't be that way, but Maisha has to represent her race. Cause a lot of times I am in a lot of white spaces when I'm behind that table. So when I see a black actor and artist come in, I'm fighting for you right away. You haven't even said anything. I, your monologue can be trash, but I'm just hoping that you're something good so that I can at least get you a call back in that room. So for Maisha, she's someone who honestly, that's why I constantly fight for it, is that little dark black girl who is just not getting that attention and making sure that her voice is heard and that she's seen as beautiful, as soft, as delicate, as strong, as everything all in one and not just somebody to be played as a caricature or a stereotype. So building off of what you just shared, and we talk about that a lot when we have interviews with other, with other women, what do you feel that you see maybe in the greater scope of the industry, theatrical or film-wise, that is missing for the, the Maishas of the world and for women of color or persons of color in their roles? What do you feel the industry um, needs to do in order to open that door more and, and remove the caricatures and actually start sharing our stories? One thing that's been coming to mind a lot for me lately is balance. And I feel that that's, I feel like for a lot of us, it's just black people who watch entertainment 
that's what a lot of our issues are when I see a lot of people on social media where they're just like, here we go with another slave film or here we go with you misrepresenting us or, you know, I feel like there's no balance. Uh, because Netflix has been coming out with a lot of those like old nostalgic TV shows, I'm starting to realize that in the 90s and early 2000s, that when they gave us a slave show, they also gave us Living Single. When they gave us this struggling Black people thing, we had half and half. We were able to have a balance of comedy and drama. And I feel like in this day and age, because everyone's so gung-ho on activism, which I think is great, that they're missing that black people have more to offer than tragedy and just other people of color as well. I just feel like a lot of times with minorities, they give us very tragic shows or, or, or things that just are full of trauma and they don't give us any balance. We don't get as many comedies. We, we don't get as many, you know, just stuff that you just made cause you made it like holiday movies, just random stuff that's lifting your spirits. So I feel like if we had a balance and I, that would really, make people feel a lot more comfortable when it comes to the stuff that people are producing. I feel like in the industry, we just don't have a balance. They're giving us more trauma than they're giving us good times. And after a while, what do little kids have to look forward to if all the entertainment and films and everything is just full of trauma? At some point, we've got to, you know, smile and laugh. Every day can't be traumatic. That's extremely depressing. Um, and I also, the second thing that I feel is they need to hire us. When it comes to, even before it comes to the people who are, on, who are on stage or who are in front of the camera saying those lines, when you don't have a Black casting director uh, in a show that's <laughs> centered around Black people or any other person of color, and you don't have a, someone that looks like them casting these shows, that's when a lot of colorism issues come into play. Even though sometimes there are people that look like us that you know, per perpetuate colorism as well. But a lot of times that's where we get these shows where we have families that are black, but clearly they don't look like any of them are related to one another. You know, when you don't have black directors, then you have white people, mainly white people telling our stories and then misrepresenting them and making up characters. I know like the film Harriet, I still haven't seen it. Uh, people said like, they just made up entire human beings that never even existed. And I just feel like, well, what's the point of that? I'm sure these people's lives are way more interesting than the stuff you can make up. And, you know, I just feel that if we have us behind the scenes on directing, casting, producing, and actually having a foot in a door, then we can be able to pick up the next person and help them up that ladder and just not be a gatekeeper who's stopping. And we only have four or five black people who are the, these are the black people in entertainment. And then everyone else is kind of just forgotten about. I wanted to ask you, we talked to a lot of um, actresses and a common thread is, especially for those who are just starting out is that they want to be equity. They want to have representation. They want these things. Is there any advice? Um, because I know you you have talent representation. Um, is there any advice you would give those women? And do you think that that is a necessity for this industry? Do I think it's a necessity? Yes and no. No, because you can make it happen without having representation, I would say at the beginning, especially for those uh, people who don't have anything on their resume. Like if you don't have anything on your resume, a lot of times, even when you apply to an agent, they're just not even going to call you in to interview because there's no resume. So I feel like with the way social media is nowadays, there are a lot of Facebook groups that have acting groups on there where they post auditions. There are a lot of websites that post auditions no matter which city or state you live in. So it's not hard to find these auditions. Actors Access, Casting Networks, these are places that you can find auditions and some of it you don't even need an agent to do so. So when you're just starting out and you have nothing on your resume, I would say no, don't don't let your first thought is I have to get an agent. Your first thought should be, I need to get some work because if you have no work and then you're coming into an agent interview, it makes no sense. Also, I would say the next thing would be make sure you're confident because for me, the only, my very first agent that I got when I moved out here, because my very first agent I ever had was when I was in high school. So I, and, and all these people I sought out, I just have this personality of like, 
I'm gonna get it regardless. So you, so you know, you don't have to build, you don't have to put a chair up there for me or a table. I'll bring my own. I'm coming in the door. So that's pretty much how my whole attitude has been in this industry. And I feel like that is benefiting me because it's going well so far, you know, Hey, you, of course there's always hiccups in a row, but I've been able to, you know, I'm SAG eligible. I can join equity when I want to, you know, that's where my career has taken me with me saying, I don't care. I'll bring my own chair, girl. Here you go right here. Here I am. So for me, I say, like I said, confidence is very important. When I got my first agent, when I moved out here to Chicago, I applied to a lot of different people, especially the bigger people. Um, but I only had so much of my resume. Really, all I had on my resume as far as like film reel was scenes from 12 years, because like I said, I was able to get really good footage where I just wasn't some random person in the back. So that honestly, I feel like helped me a lot to at least get an interview. They were like, oh, you already did a movie and you know, you were in it. So that's good enough for us. But I was lucky in that sense. But that didn't seal me getting signed. I walked in and I, I legit, I asked them, hey, how many black women do you have on your roster? They said two. And I told them, well, I'm your third. I'm the next Viola Davis. Uh, and I proceeded to, you know, like I came in there with a confidence and air about me that if you don't sign me, then that's a bigger mistake you're making. It's not a mistake that I'm making that you don't sign me. So I feel that a lot of people who want to get in this industry have to make sure that they are confident, have to make sure they have tough skin, because at the end of the day, this industry is not for the faint of heart. A lot of people are going to be rejected. You're going to get a hundred no's. Like they say, you get a hundred no's before you get one yes. And that's just what it is. So those that don't have representation, I would say that for them. For those that are looking for representation uh, and do you think, should you have it in the industry on the yes side? Yes, because a lot of times when it comes to feature films and it comes to TV shows that are union shows that are syndicated and on TV, you need an agent to get you in that room. Sometimes there are open calls that happen, but it doesn't happen often. So you have to have representation a lot of times because it's someone who's speaking for you before you enter that room. So like I told my agent, yo, I'm the next Viola Davis. So when they speak for me, they're like, you know, of course, I'm sure this is not what they say, but they're like, you know, oh, yo, we have the next Viola over here. You better get up in that room because all I'm telling you, she, she's going to make it. And so they're boosting for you and they're making your presence known even before you get there, which helps you to get in that room so when they see you you walk in with of course i'm here i belong here and you audition and when you have that confidence in yourself nine times out of i'm saying nine times out of ten but it, it happens for me nine times out of ten you're getting a call back and you know at least so i really feel that at a point when you get to the point in your career where you're having a lot of indie films where you have stuff for your your acting reel where you've got some theater on your resume it's time for you to start looking for an agent because at that point you can't do it all on your own anymore you need someone to vouch for you when it comes to those bigger film houses so bridging from having that confidence in order to get in the room or get the call back so when you've been in the room before um and they've asked you to perform a cold read what is your approach or your process right away I'm a fast reader so I hurry up and skim it so I'm like at least I can get the basics out of the way I hurry up and see where they are I look to see what show it is to see if I even know what show it is and then I uh skim it real quick to see hey okay what is happening look at punctuation to make sure I'm not losing my mind and I'm not making stuff up that just doesn't exist that the writer didn't put on the page and like I said going in there with confidence I read it a few times and then I'm like okay so this is how Maisha would approach this character especially it's size for a show that I've seen done before I try to make sure that I bring my own spin to it so that they remember me and I'm not just somebody that did it how that other person did it. Well, we're going to take you through a cold read now. Hey. Um, we would like for you to read for Lori. And Vanny, did you want to read for Naya or do you want me to read? You muted. it. <laughs> Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and whenever you're ready, you can start. 
fucking fifth period. You turn in your reports? Not yet. Humphreys is on my ass. English department head or not, I told him to give me a damn break. I only just had my face reconstructed, asshole. You look good, Lauren. I can't even tell. My husband can. And my daughter. I freak her out, she says. Everything freaks her out. That isn't painted with at least a gazillion ounces of mascara. Or liters. Oh, however the fuck mascara is measured. She's fucking obsessed with it. That's all I know. I mean, what the hell happened to teenagehood? I remember dyeing my hair orange and piercing my nose to rage against the status quo. That was sort of a cause, you know. But now it's just all mascara and fashion and the next top supermodel housewife of blah, blah, blah. Whatever the hell. What are we doing? You know, are they growing down? Probably. And the substitute was an idiot. I asked my kids what they do all day when I was gone. <laughs> Three ninth grade to 10th grade to 12th. I'd outlast them all, <laughs> bastards. You're a pistol woman. I'm a goddamn machine gun. How's your son? Trouble. Next question. You figured out what you're going to do about... No. I haven't figured out a thing. I'm slipping off the edge of the earth and there is no answer in the dark, dark universe. The world isn't flat, Naya. Mine is, Lori. It's flat and coming to a quick and fast end. And I can't stop it. You can. You just gotta grab it by the balls and turn it around. That son of yours needs a swift kick in the ass. That's not what he needs. I remember when parents would give you permission for you to spank their kids in class. You old enough to remember that? We teach teenagers. Especially the teenagers. <laughs> I don't think I remember that. That was the best. I'm telling you, I had this one kid, Louis Gaspaccio. I remember him real good. You know how some of them stay with you for a lifetime? He had the kind of a, a schizophrenia thing going on. Undiagnosed, but I knew. And they should let us prescribe the drugs instead of these bogus doctors. I know these kids inside and out. I knew Louie, another kid I think uh, Ritlin ruined. Hmm. But his friend listened to that sorry excuse of a counselor, Miss Esselman, who, who would recommend a drug to Jesus if she couldn't get him to sit still for five minutes. Never figured maybe it was her tactics and not the kid, but whatever. His folks would never get him tested for his mental health. Couldn't afford the medical bills. Half these damn kids are suffering from mental illness. That's what the real problem is. A classroom can't fix that shit. And neither can Ritland. But what do they know? Nothing. <laughs> That's what. I know what these kids need. But who's listening to me? <laughs> anyway, what the hell was I talking about? Louis Gaspacho? Exactly. He could be a terror if he was really having a day. So one time he threw a book at me, nearly knocked out the smart little West Indian girl that sat right in front of him. Mm, maybe you shouldn't call her that. Grabbed his little scrawny ass in the middle of class and gave him three licks <laughs> on the backside. <laughs> Never threw a book again. And that kid got almost straight A's that year. They don't give me any credit for that because he got institutionalized a couple years later and pulled out of school. So it's like he never existed. Hm. But I had him functioning high, you know. A good old ass whooping can teach a lot. That's not O's problem, Lori. I wasn't saying that. I, I just... It's too many things. It's me. I'm the source and I know it, and I just can't talk about this anymore if I'm going to get through the rest of the day, okay? 
I had to drive upstate to pick them up after work and I'll finish stressing then. Don't panic, honey. We're all a bunch of screw ups trying to figure out our mess. You'll figure it out. Screw ups? Figure of speech. Don't take that literal. It, it, it's not literal. Right. And scene and scene. <laughs> How do you feel about that one? I feel great. First off, I know Pipeline because I watched it. So it's so interesting. Uh, <laughs> teacher, I remember her and she she's a she is a firecracker. And I am I myself, even though I'm, I'm 28, but I'm old enough to remember getting whoopers in class. So I <laughs> So uh, they stopped that around the second grade when I was little. Like they, we, they sent notes home to everybody and said they can't whoop our kids anymore. Uh, <laughs> so no, I, I feel uh, good about that. How do y'all feel about it? I feel like it was fun. I love cold reads. I love your reading. I'm, and then every time I read, I get caught up in listening to the reader. I'm like, don't lose your line, child. Don't lose your line. Because, you know, you can just envision it. Like, and that's what I love about when people conduct cold reads, like, and what I, you know, even look for when I'm directing, like, I could see you forming it into who you believe that character was. You know, you could hear it in your voice. And if you can paint that picture for me for a cold read, then it's like, yes, come back through the door again, you know? And so I enjoy listening to your cold read. Thank you. So, Maisha, what's what's next for you post COVID? I know COVID is in the way. What's next for you, man? COVID, I tell you, she she just don't know how to go home. She just don't know how to go home. <laughs> so, what's next for me is we're currently planning our uh, second season uh, for Perceptions Theater. So, our 2021 season, we've been able to produce a, a play this year and another short festival play this year. So. I'm working on be able, being able to employ more Black people and Indigenous people and people of color so that, you know, hey, you know, paying actors, that's, that's, that's what I'm up here trying to do, paying actors and paying technicians. Um, I'm also, of course, working on my own acting career and seeing where that goes. I'm getting a lot more auditions lately, which is great because COVID definitely slowed a lot of that down. Um, and... Now that I'm a content creator, I have put myself on a more consistent schedule for my YouTube channel, which is uh, MT's Corner with Maisha Tierra. And I talk about all things involving the Black acting world, from my own experiences to acting advice to just giving my opinion on situations that happen in the Black acting world. And by situations, I mean anything art related, anything about their marriages and stuff. I leave that to the bloggers because I don't care about none of that. All I care about is their art. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's where I am trying to balance life and hoping that COVID go home so that we can really be back out here because it has hindered us a lot just as artists I mean everything has to be virtual now I mean theaters aren't even open and, and that's movie theaters as well as you know stage production so just finding what's next and adapting to this new virtual world that we have to adapt to at this point well I am so grateful you joined us today and I can tell that you had, you are, are of a growth mindset. You're driven, you are um, courageous and we need more people like you fighting for the community as a whole in the entertainment industry. And so I thank you for what you've done so far and I know the best is yet to come. So thank you so nice. much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Bye.